I'd like to welcome everyone and ask you to find your seats. As you can see, we have a very full house tonight, um, which I take as a good sign of the hunger in our communities to see Jews, Muslims, and Christian engaged together in civil dialogue. This is something that we need to hear more of, and we're happy to be here doing tonight. Those of you who are standing in the back who would like to sit down, um, we actually have an overflow crowd. I almost said an overflow service like the high holidays. Uh, there's an overflow in the Women's League Seminary Synagogue, and if you go to the ushers in the back, they will bring you there so that you can find a comfortable seat and watch as we video stream it. Um, I want to welcome you all to the Jewish Theological Seminary for this groundbreaking panel on Judaism and Islam in America. And we are going to discuss tonight the questions of assimilation and authenticity. Um, my name is Bert Vysotsky. I am the Appleman Professor of Midrash and Interreligious Studies here at the Jewish Theological Seminary and Director of the Louis Finkelstein Institute for Religious and Social Studies, tasked with interreligious dialogue and public policy. Now, tonight's program is one of our annual Jack and Lewis Rudin Lectures. The Rudin Lecture Series at JTS provides opportunity for eminent academics, religious leaders, intellectuals, and public figures to discuss topics of interest with the JTS community and you, the public at large. And although Jack and Susan Rudin unfortunately couldn't be here this evening, we want to take this opportunity to extend their thanks for their support for the Rudin Lecture Series named for Mr. Rudin and his late brother, Lewis. We are also very happy to welcome Mr. Mark Bodden of the Rudin Foundation, who is joining us here tonight. Mark, where are you? and for his continued support. Um, many of you received, when you walked in, a uh, index card, I hope all of you did. And at two different points in the evening, we will ask you um, if you have questions when people are speaking or during the conversation, to please write them down. The ushers will collect them, give them to me, and I will sort them and give them to our moderator. Let me just say a few words about tonight's event and the events surrounding it. This is the public portion of a two-day closed workshop between Jews and Muslims, um, 10 Jews, 10 Muslims, leaders each in their community. And as I like to say, we also invited four Christian leaders just to kibitz in the room. Um, <laughs> the event is co-sponsored uh, in a very important grouping, the Jewish Theological Seminary, the Hartford Seminary, and the Islamic Society of North America. And the impressive array of institutions has brought us financial support from the Carnegie Corporation, the Center for Interfaith Understanding, and the Heschel Society. I want to say that I'm enormously excited because in our conversations today already, um, starting this morning and going through this afternoon, the amount of common ground that Jews and Muslims as minority in religions in America share is simply enormous, overwhelming, and we have so much to learn from one another. And all of us in the room, every single one of us, is dedicated not only to interreligious dialogue, but to moving beyond dialogue to see how our communities can work together. Um, I will reiterate once again, you do have your, your little three by five cards. Um, I'm inviting you to write your questions. Um, even though I am a scholar who works with manuscripts, please write neatly. I can't guarantee that I will otherwise be able to decipher them. Um, if you want an instant replay of tonight's panel, um, we are streaming this on the JTS website, www.jtsa.edu. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce our panelists. In the gray suit, <laughs> from the University of Pennsylvania, um, the Chancellor of the Jewish Theological Seminary, Chancellor Arnold Eisen.
Arnie is one of the world's leading experts on American Jewry. He's deeply engaged in efforts to revitalize Jewish education in America, as well as prominent in interfaith and interdenominational dialogue. He is the author of, among other books, Taking Hold of Torah, Jewish Commitment and Community in America, and most recently, co-author of The Jew Within, Self, Family, and Community in America. Sitting to Arnie's left is Professor Sherman Jackson. Um, Sherman teaches Islamic studies at the University of Michigan. He is a leading authority on Islam, Islamic law, and Muslims in America. Professor Jackson is the author of Islam and the Black American, Looking Toward the Third Resurrection, and most recently, Islam and the Problem of Black Suffering. To to Sherman's left, Serene Jones. The Reverend Dr. Serene Jones is the 16th president of the Union Theological Seminary, the institution's first female president. For those of you that don't know Union, it is the liberal theological uh, Protestant seminary right across the street from JTS, and we are happy to continually be on good relations with Union. Um, <laughs> Professor Jones' research has focused on gender, theology, and globalization. She is the author of numerous scholarly articles and books, and her most recent book, which uh, I can say is absolutely numinous, is called Trauma and Grace. And our moderator is Dr. Ingrid Matson. Ingrid is professor of Islamic studies, founder of the Islamic Chaplaincy Program, director of the McDonald Center for Islamic Studies and Christian-Muslim Relations at Hartford Seminary, and in her spare time, uh, Ingrid just finished a long and very successful term as the president of the Islamic Society of North America. Her research and writing focuses on Islamic law and ethics and the Quran. She is the author of The Story of the Quran, Its History and Place in Muslim Life, a book that I heartily recommend to all of you. Um, Professor Matson, you're the moderator. All right. Okay, well, um, before you, you scribble down your questions already, I bet some of you already have, I just want to remind you that we're not talking about everything having to do with Judaism and Islam today. We are focusing on the issue of Judaism and Islam in America today, assimilation and authenticity. Uh, really trying to tease out this topic. So um, you may want to wait until you've heard the opening statements of our three presenters. Before you write a question, you'll have a better chance of getting it selected for being answered if it is on topic. So. Um, <laughs> Just out of compassion for the audience, I wanted to inform you of that. Um, so we're going to begin with a short uh, opening statement by um, each of our three presenters, uh, five to ten minutes, and we will begin with uh, Chancellor Ar Arnie Eisen. Thanks, Ingrid. It's a real honor for me to be present at this event and be Chancellor of JTS and the host of this event. I thought I'd begin this session with the Abrahamic traditions represented at the table here and in the room by saying that Jews like me, who've been in synagogue the last few weeks, have been reading the stories of the founding of our tradition. And one of the remarkable things, the truly remarkable things when you think about stories of the founding of a tradition is that these original stories of covenant do not only concern Abraham and Sarah, as one might expect, but Hagar and Ishmael, who are both very much on the scene before Isaac arrives. And that would be remarkable enough. And even more remarkable, I think, is that when God establishes the sign of the covenant with Abraham and makes the sign of that covenant circumcision on male flesh, Abraham inscribes that sign upon himself and upon his firstborn son, Ishmael. Isaac is not yet on the scene. And the effect of this story, profoundly, I think, is that Jews from the outset share the sign of the covenant with another people, another tradition. 
Now, if our topic is assimilation and authenticity, part of what we're concerned with in authenticity and why it becomes an issue is that so much is changing. When you're, as it were, in the old country, whatever that old country is, you don't have debates about your own authenticity. You don't have to worry about it. It's just there with the territory. And authenticity arises when the conditions are so palpably different and you see yourself being so palpably different that you worry about whether you are legitimate, whether you have the right to be and do as you are, whether you are truly continuous with your past. And so one of the things that I want to do, which Jews want to do, is I want to be continuous with this scripture. It, it, it governs my life. The meaning of my life is anchored in it. I want to make sense of it for me right here and now. And so part of my effort at authenticity is I want to know what this story about Abraham and Sarah and Hagar and Ishmael and Isaac says to me right now. And I know I'm going to change. I know I'm not the Jew that my parents were and my grandparents were, and yet in some sense I am because they too are worried about the story and about the legal tradition that came from it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We share all of this, and yet I'm concerned that these changes not lead me to disappear. And part of what I do that my ancestors may not have done is I hang on for dear life to this text. It's a tree of life to those that hold fast to it, and holding fast to it for me is an option. I know that I can let go at any moment, which was not true of my ancestors, and if I let go, I'm lost. But what does it mean to hold on? What does it mean to relax one's grip? What does it mean to change one's footing, as it were, in relationship to this tradition? So I begin with this story as a way of posing the question which we all share, is when do we change so much when do we adopt so much from our surroundings that, was, that we call it assimilation or disappearance? And when is it that kind of change which is integral to a tradition which has always been done, which is the key to authenticity, because if Islam or Judaism or Christianity is going to live for another generation, it has to live in us, for us, and through us. Now let me pose the, the, the question a little more starkly by starting with a brief quotation from a leading sociologist of American Jewish life named Charles Liebman, who passed away a few years ago, who in 1973, as I graduated from college and first started thinking about an intellectual career in this field, published a groundbreaking book called The Ambivalent American Jew. And Liebman argued that Jews were ambivalent because they wanted to fit in and they also wanted to be different. In the words that I used in my doctoral dissertation, Jews wanted to be a part of America more than anything else in the world, but they also wanted to retain status as apart from America. Liebman poses it this way, and I quote him because he poses it very starkly. If the Jewish community is to survive, it must become more explicit and conscious about the incompatibility of integration and survival. If Judaism is to survive, it must, at least to some extent, reject the value of integration, which I see as sapping its very essence. I say that Lieben poses it starkly because he doesn't make the alternatives integration or apartness. He makes the alternatives integration and survival, and then he comes down firmly and says, integrate too much, you don't survive. So the question is, how do we find this balance? Where exactly is that line, that tipping point, where you've integrated so much you don't survive because you also know, and you know this particularly if you have students or if you have kids, if you don't integrate at all, you also don't survive because the imperative of being part of the larger society is just so powerful. So one of the distinguishing marks about American Judaism, and we, we'll have to see if Christianity and Islam share this to any extent, and if so, how much, is that we have integrated and survived and also threatened integration and survival in the United States, we Jews, by defining ourselves in two ways, which are either paradoxical or contradictory depending on your point of view. One is that we are an ethnic group. We stand alongside African Americans and Italian Americans and German Americans, et cetera, et cetera. And on the other hand, we are a religious group. We stand alongside Christianity and Islam. And when of the, one of the seminal articles that got me thinking about this was stated by the head of the Reform Jewish Seminary in the 1930s, who said, quote, nation 
people, religion, what are we? What are we? And his answer, interestingly enough, was we can't be ethnicity because that's false to the covenant. We can't be ethnicity because that will not lead to Jewish survival. We have to be religion and only religion and everything else is secondary. Well, interestingly enough, a magazine called The Christian Century, which was a leading liberal Protestant organ in 1936 and 1937, published a set of essays to the same effect, saying to Jews, you have no right to define yourselves as an ethnicity in the United States. Your place here must be as a religious group because America cannot tolerate hereditary minorities to survive. You must take your place as a religious group among other religious groups, which means you argue for the adherence of every believer all the time. If that person wants to join your religion, fine. If they don't, they don't. But for example, prohibition of intermarriage is out of the question because you're here to be a religion and nothing but a religion. We worry about that in Judaism still. We worry about whether a definition of ethnicity is legitimate, whether a definition as ethnicity will be sufficient to guarantee Jewish survival. And when we worry about um, assimilation and authenticity, that is certainly one of the questions we have in front of us. Finally, I want to raise one more issue for our panel because I think it's at the forefront of religious thought in our time and should be and has to be. And I say to rabbinical students today that 30 years ago, rabbinical students in your place would not have known that this question is going to be at the top of their agenda and it is at the top of your agenda. And that question is, is religious pluralism compatible with religious commitment? This is not an easy question to answer. The answer has to be yes, I believe. But we can't give that affirmative answer on the basis of public relations necessities. To be convincing, as it were, to be authentic, the justification of religious pluralism has to come from inside religious faith. That has to be the source of it. And I think that one of the greatest necessities of our time is for religious thinkers to make arguments that show that pluralism is not relativism, that having a covenant does leave room for other covenants, as in fact I believe that story in Genesis argues, that one can believe that other peoples, other faiths have a claim on God, on truth, on salvation, on the right way to be in this world, and saying that does not mean that we sacrifice any of the commitment that we have to this tradition. So the time when you could say, it's my way or you go to hell, which has been the predominant mode of religion in the world for many hundreds of years, that has got to be behind us and everyone in this room knows that it is not behind us because we hear the exponents of that position on TV, on the radio, in the papers, on the web, every single day of the week. And it's incumbent upon us who are religious leaders who speak in the name of tradition, and let me say humbly, in the name of God, to make the case that pluralism is not just a nice thing, it is a religious imperative that's grounded in the very nature of God and covenant and religious community. And I think until we do that, the future is not secure. Professor Jackson. <clears throat> uh, thank you very much. This so close. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Ingrid. And I want to uh, thank uh, Chancellor Eisen for this wonderful opportunity to come. Oh. Uh, I wanted to thank uh, Chancellor Eisen for this wonderful opportunity to come and uh, to share intellectual capital uh, with you all over a topic that is uh, dear to us all. And I want to uh, commend uh, JTS and all of those who are responsible for uh, this opportunity uh, for both the vision uh, and especially the courage uh, to uh, reach out and to provide a, a safe space within which uh, to, uh, to discuss uh, very, very difficult uh, uh, issues. Um, I think that one of the things that I want to say to sort of contextualize not only my remarks but the overall discussion um, is that I think that the 
the realities that confront Jews and Muslims as minority religious communities in America, um, as has been already mentioned, are astoundingly similar. Um, and yet, um, these kinds of conversations have been very, very slow in coming. And I think that part of the problem there is that um, we are much more uh, sort of sensitized to and animated uh, by the problematic dimensions of the relationship between uh, Jews and Muslims in the world uh, to the point that that tends to push us psychologically uh, to a point where we don't recognize the cooperative possibilities. And I want to emphasize that as something that is not simply a modern phenomenon, but that, that is something that goes back to the very core uh, and the very essential tradition of Islam itself. The Prophet Muhammad, uh, when he was forced out of his home in Mecca and migrated to Medina, uh, he came into Medina. And at that time, there was a standing Jewish community in Medina. And the Prophet himself was responsible for um, promulgating and putting together a document um, that scholars refer to as the Constitution of Medina, a little anachronistically. But nevertheless, it was a document that basically said the following, that we Muslims and we Jews and even we pagans here in Medina will enter into a pact to protect the sanctity of Medina as the home of us all. And he recognized that the Jews have their religion, the Muslims have their religion, the uh, pre-Islamic Arabs have their religion, and yet he was entering into a pact that said, we will conserve the integrity of Medina as a safe space for us all. And I say this not only to alert my Jewish friends that there are possibilities in the relationship between Islam and Judaism that we need to be more sensitive to, but also to my Muslim co-religionists, to, to understand that this kind of cooperative interaction and exchange is authentically a part of the Muslim tradition. In fact, the prophet, in fact, in his very words of the Constitution as they've come down to us, makes a very striking statement. He says that the Muslims and the Jews in Medina, and he goes down a long list of the very various Jewish tribes, he says the Muslims and the Jews are an ummah. Now, for Muslims, that's an extraordinarily powerful word. And the point that I'm trying to get to here is this, is that for Jews and Muslims to come together and work in a manner that promotes the mutual interest of both um, should not be looked upon as a zero-sum game. Sometimes we don't want to come together and do something that's going to benefit the other party. Even if it's going to benefit us, we see something not quite right about doing things that would benefit the other party. And I want to reiterate here that uh, the prophet's precedent itself um, shows us that this is not the attitude that Muslims should have. Now, moving on more uh, specifically to the assigned topic of assimilation versus authenticity, um, I want to start out by saying that for Muslims in America, the concept or the construct of assimilation is a rather problematic one for most Muslims, not all, and we should get out of the habit of thinking of Muslims in terms of being a monolith. They are not. But for most Muslims, um, the, the notion of assimilation is a problematic one. Now, when you look at the demographics of the Muslim community, about one-third of Muslims in America are black American indigenous converts. Uh, Two-thirds are from the 70-odd countries uh, of, of the Muslim world, and then there are Hispanic and, and white American converts as well. Certainly, for black American converts, the notion of assimilation is very negatively charged 
coming out of their own historical narrative as black Americans. I think that we have to remember that there's an extent to which black Americans are perhaps one of the only groups in America that in a sense become more authentic the more they display a sense of protest and resistance. That is to say, to the extent that black Americans seem to, to unceremoniously simulate into the dominant culture, they become known as Uncle Toms. Uh, and I don't think that anything uh, captures the, the crime of sort of cultural apostasy with the perfect awfulness of the description Uncle Tom. That is the historical narrative out of which black Americans come and coming into Islam carries some of that with it. For immigrant Muslims, and I'm for the sake of simplicity, I'm oversimplifying the Muslim community here, but for, 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 for immigrant Muslims, I think that what we have to recognize is that the Muslim world is introduced to modernity not simply as a, a chronological development, but rather as a development that entails the rise of the West. And so they experience Western modernity, and they experience Western modernity as objects of Western power. And what this has, has imbued them with is a very subtle but yet operative sense that, that to find justifications for ingratiating oneself with the dominant culture of the West um, is, a, is a very difficult task because the extent to which one assimilates into the West or the dominant culture of the West, um, that is often experienced as a move of capitulation that we are indeed, in a sense, confirming a process that began in the 18th and 19th century when the Western powers first showed up on the shores of the Muslim world. And so assimilation, whether we are talking about indigenous black American Muslims or Muslims who emigrated from the Muslim world, is somewhat of a problematic construct, um, which is one of the reasons why Which is one of the reasons why um, I, I, I personally avoid the term or the construct of assimilation. And what I like to, um, to think about and to try to develop ways of realizing is not the assimilation of Islam into America, but the indigenization of Islam. That is to say, the problem that Muslims face right now is not so much that they are not assimilated. Um, if you look at the, the immigrant community, they do quite well in moving into some of the very, uh, they're very highly educated, very, very wealthy community. They occupy some very um, nice spaces in American society. Even for black Americans, marginalization 50 years ago is not marginalization right now. What Muslims uh, uh, have to confront is not so much the fact that Islam is not assimilated, but that Islam is not indigenous, that Islam is alien that it's foreign. And in that regard, in that context, it's very easy to alienate Muslims and then lay down a criterion for their reintegration um, that says you must sacrifice this aspect, that aspect, or the other aspect of your religious identity, religious slash cultural identity, in order for you to gain admission into the sanctum of a bona fide American. Um, she's getting nervous. I'm getting nervous. I'm going to stop right there. <laughs> and hopefully I'm nervous. We'll finish it <laughs> Dr. Jones. Let me just echo my colleagues and say what a pleasure it is to be here. Chancellor Eisen, thank you for your hospitality. Um, and... Um, both of you, I have read your works for uh, many years. I have watched you on television, even on YouTube, and uh, <laughs> it's an honor to be sitting up here with you. Uh, 
In my mind, the two of you represent that category of organic intellectual, Gramscian's notion of um, those whose work is in the soil of what they are describing. So I want to thank you for that. It's also interesting uh, to talk about what we have in common in this conversation uh, today as we were discussing many topics. I rewrote this talk over and over in my head and found out at dinner that uh, you had both been doing the same thing and we're all up here with scribbled notes which I think is a sign of the importance of the conversation, that the categories that are being generated or categories that are literally being written down by our pens as we are thinking them through. Uh, so that is, I think, an important part of the energy here. To approach these questions of assimilation and authenticity from where I sit is to claim at the outset that as the president of a school in the reformed Calvinist uh, tradition, I sit in the belly of the beast, the quintessential assimilationist religion. <laughs> in fact, in Calvinism, we have a tale of the self and its presence in the world, which makes a virtue out of assimilism. You, you assimilate in order to be authentic, uh, consistent, and um, never stopping um, narrative of missionizing and conversion. Now, it's interesting to sit in this position to have this conversation for several reasons. Um, at dinner, uh, Arnie asked me, what does it feel like to um, engage the question of authenticity from a position of the dominant culture, the dominant religion? Are you worried about disappearing? That's a very interesting question to answer for several reasons. First of all, one of the interesting things about the Reformed tradition in North America is that you find it spanning the spectrum of theological uh, positions and political positions. You find evangelicals on the right, you find the United Church of Christ on the far left, but what they all share as the dominant religion is a story about themselves that posits themselves as a minority. Um, <laughs> that, that, they see, that they see themselves always as under assault from a culture whose values they have to protect. So it raises some questions about how we even interpret the categories of cultural marginality and how they fit in the stories we tell about ourselves. Secondly, it's a rather new reality, but one that is growing, that in North America, in fact, uh, the Protestant and Roman Catholic uh, churches are declining in rapid numbers. So in fact, the reality of our disappearance is on the horizon of our very identity. And then thirdly, I have to say, when confronted with this question of the disappearance, of uh, reformed Christianity. Um, I feel frightened also when I see in the present political environment reformed Christianity used to justify a rhetoric of cruelty and of exclusion and often have this profound sense that my own religion has been absconded with by the dominant culture which is doing harm with it. So it's a peculiar position to stand in for all of those reasons because in the reformed tradition that I have been raised in and work as a theologian out of, the notion of grace that sits at the center of it, a notion of law as a place in which boundaries are created for the purpose of opening, that edges and walls exist in order that we might be hospitable, um, that that which is exists for the purpose of reaching out towards that which it is not. Um, is a kind of founding moment in the very um, notion of the divine that sits at the heart of my own faith. Now, when I approach this question, um, too, I don't only approach it as uh, the president of a mainline reformed seminary, but also as a teacher of theology who sits at a school where the question of forming ministers is at the front of my mind every morning when my feet touch the ground. And what does it mean to teach religious leaders to lead in this environment? And when I reflect on that and my students, I come up with a very different set of reflections on these categories of assimilation and authenticity. Um, the first, and I want to make three comments in this regard. The first is that when I think about the forces of assimilation um, in the US right now, um, they pay, uh, the, the forces of religious diversity in terms of the world they create amongst themselves, ourselves, it, that force pales in comparison to the force exerted by the market. 
that the major assimilative force that all of us are grappling with is a market which commodifies our desires and turns the way we understand human value into something that we can purchase and lay a value on by bringing in to our life and own it. And that is happening across the board. Um, and it's not only happening across the board in the US, but it's happening um, around the world, which raises the question of the character and shape of desire and imagination with respect to that kind of cultural force. And uh, what, does, what does resistance mean in that context? Um, secondly, I am uh, re busy reading these days lots of books on leadership and stumble again and again, particularly when reading business books on leadership, to this category, authentic leadership. Um, corporations around the country are having seminars on authentic leadership and I find myself asking what does it mean to be an authentic leader and in that literature it means to be completely self-present it means to stand before people and be truly yourself um, for there to be no distance between who you say you are and who you are performing in fact it's to learn the art of performing non-performance you know, you're just there. Um, and you're just there in such a way that pulls the community in who are authentically responding to your authentic leadership. Um, now, it, it would be even more humorous if I didn't see any of this in my own students. Um, but an interesting thing that's happening um, at Union, I think it's happening in theological education across the country, is the two groups that are growing the fastest are um, evangelical Pentecostals and the unaffiliated. Um, and both of those groups um, understand themselves as being anti-institutional and valorizing notions of personal and pietistic authenticity as a mark of true religiosity. Um, it's a shift from a notion of education and authority and textual interpretation prowess to a notion of um, intense uh, pietistic spiritual presence. Um, so that, I think, then changes the understanding of authenticity um, uh, in a way that moves across, I think, uh, some of our differences to what we do with this notion of the spiritual. Um, thirdly, what I see in my students um, is when it comes to the notion of assimilation, this reality called the Internet and Facebook brings into the very core of their identity an assimilative moment that is beyond anything I could have ever imagined when I was their age and undergoing theological education. When you're on the internet, the boundaries between yourself and others are fluid. Um, you can be in the process of constantly recreating yourself. You are in one moment connected to 300 people, and yet you are alone. The whole notion of a boundary, which assimilation um, thrives on is, is problematized in that context. So one question I have is what term might we use to signify assimilation in an environment which is saturated with the assimilative moment? And then finally, um, I want to talk about a, a sort of fourth uh, pressure, and that is how my uh, own students often think about interfaith conversation. Um, when I was going through seminary in the 70s and 80s, um, the conversation about interfaith always imagined in the landscape of our minds when we thought about what we were doing, these entities that would come to a table and have a discussion. And the entities represented historical traditions and groups of people. Um, for many of my students, interfaith is an interior reality. Um, it's interior to their families, but it's also interior to their own identities. Um, that it's not just something that lives in a space of conversation, but has actually begun in our pluralistic context to occupy the very nature of their own subjectivity, even when they don't know it is. And I think that's a real challenge for us sorting through our traditions is how much at the level of desire and the unconscious and of daily practices and of relationships we're already assimilative um, in our own sense of what even constitutes authenticity. Um, there's much more to be said, I think, about how these categories uh, shape a theological response 
um, uh, and a, uh, a theological terms of engagement, but what I'm describing is not only coming at us, it's coming fast. I have images of sort of a tidal wave that's, that's sweeping us all in its wake. Um, and in that context, it's profound what we share in contrast to the differences. And we have much to talk about, the nature of the law, and what does it mean for the law to be aesthetic and beautiful. Um, talk about practices of daily life, which may be the thing that lives underneath that space of doctrine that actually holds our religious identities. Um, and then finally, uh, an issue that has preoccupied me recently, uh, we live in a violent world, and we live in the midst of communities and of selves who suffer enormous trauma. And what does trauma do in the context of religious traditions with respect to specific articulations of it, but also trauma as the great levelizer? Um, and violence as the great levelizer. Um, and, and how do we then think about that in its context? So, thank you. So th thank you all of you for those wonderful um, opening remarks. Uh, it's time for you to, uh, there will be people picking up your note cards with your questions. Um, as they come down the aisles, you can hand them your, your cards, your index cards, and they'll be brought up uh, to the front. So we can, um, we can try to convey some of your questions to our panel. While we're waiting for that to be done, um, I'd first like to ask a question of our panelists and, um, and then also give them some time to respond to each other's opening presentations. I think, um, uh, uh, Serene, you most, um, most directly addressed this question but, um, or alluded to it in a number of different ways, but I'd like all of you to, um, to respond to this somehow, is that, you know, what is the society that we're talking about assimilating into? In the description of this program, it says a predominantly secular and Christian society. As you said, uh, you know, Christians often believe that they're in the minority in a secular America or in a materialistic America or an America in which authentic Christianity is under attack. Um, but, but what is this, you know, what is this society that we're asking for uh, assimilation into, and, and does the definition of that society need to be changed in order for this to be effective? So, for example, although we describe this as predominantly Christian society, certainly numerically that's the case, that American Jews worked pretty hard at a certain point to make sure that this is, uh, that, that the term Judeo-Christian um, became accepted and common usage. D did it have to, was it important that America became um, defined as a Judeo-Christian society in order for Jews to feel more comfortable assimil assimilating into that society? And if that's the case, uh, what do we do now with, with everyone who's not uh, Jewish or Christian? Look, from the very beginning, every religious tradition and every subgroup of every religious tradition has fought over a definition of America for precisely this reason. We want to be at home here, and our identities are hyphenated, and it's important that that, I, that hyphen not be schizophrenic. We have to find a way of making the tension between those two fruitful and making them work for both sides. It's, it's unquestionable, I think, that for Jews, America is the single greatest diaspora Jews have ever known in our entire history. There was just no question that the blessings of America far outweigh any of the disadvantages and tensions and problems and persecutions that America has confronted us with. So we have to make this work. We know what a blessing this place is for us, but it cannot come at the price of our identity. It cannot come at the price of disappearance. And so you find this Jewish discussion all through American Jewish history, particularly in the 20th century, exactly what you're asking. Not only what Judaism will be, but what must America be to be a place that can be a home, 
not just for Jews, but for Judaism. And there were people in the earlier period who tried to, let's say, fudge it, who tried to say that there is an inherent um, identity between American values and Jewish values. Judaism is democratic, America is democratic. We like freedom, America likes freedom. There's even as many sermons, I wrote my dissertation about these, which talk about Sinai and July 4th. The message of Sinai is exactly the message of July 4th. And we're serious about this because we have to, we have to make it so. It's expressing it as a, as a fact, but, it, but it's a wish. And all of us, when we're, when we're living as human beings, we seek a kind of wholeness, and God knows our kids want that wholeness. Our kids are growing up and do not want to be pulled apart. And if they are pulled apart, we, their parents, who cleave to a tradition, we will lose. America will win. The culture is very, very powerful. So all of us have, a, I think, a, an obligation here to try to make the culture a place that can accommodate this kind of pluralism that we're talking about. And I, as a scholar, and I think my colleagues up here too recognize that America is a great experiment in this regard. It's not as if we have precedents anywhere that we can point to to say, ah, that's the way it should be done. No, this is a novum here in history which we are trying to accomplish. That's why I'm so happy to have allies. I really do think I have allies. Um, yeah, th th I mean, it it's, it's... You do have an ally. <laughs> uh, it it's, it's really Im important to have, to have allies. Um, uh, at, at the same time, I think it's really important to have a sort of foundational conversations uh, because we, we have to understand the, the actual realities of our communities uh, such that when we craft visions for how we can move forward in this regard, those visions are based on the realities that define our communities in such a way that we can get a full buy-in with regard to how we move forward. Um, and, and here, let me just complicate the picture just a little bit uh, by, by pointing out a particular challenge that we, we face in the Muslim community. We face many challenges, but um, one particular challenge is, 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 is the following. Um, as a black American Muslim, I personally see a certain amount of power that comes from the margin. That is to say, a degree of belongingness that makes it impossible for the dominant culture to say that you're not American, while at the same time, a degree of, of autonomous power of self-definition that provides me with the, the ability to resist being assigned to a place that the dominant culture would place me in as opposed to carving out my own. Now, that comes out of my own historical narrative and trajectory uh, as a black American. The for lack of any better term, and this is a problematic term within the Muslim community, but the immigrant community and their progeny, um, I don't think recognizes that power of the margin, and they don't have any reason to. Um, and so part of the question for us becomes, well, how do we be begin to position ourselves um, in such a way that we could have a, a united strategy for moving forward in such a way that would complicate um, not simply the whole enterprise of assimilation, because I think that's only half the problem, but complicate the monopoly that the dominant culture exercises over the definition of authentic Americanness. Um, and this, this, this requires a lot of working out among ourselves uh, within uh, the Muslim community. Are we going to operate uh, through the power of the margin, or, or are we going to try to reposition ourselves uh, at the center uh, and, and, and gain uh, recognition as being a part of the dominant center? It's a question. Um, it's interesting, that the contrast here. Uh, growing up in the Reformed tradition, um, I was uh, from 
the earliest day I can remember, involved in conversations about how do we get uh, Christianity to extract itself from a complete identification with America, mm. um, in which there were, it was a seamless identification. Um, and, but an interesting thing has happened in that, that process of, do I need to move forward here? Oh, that wasn't what you were coming. In that process of, of distancing, um, the mainline Protestant traditions, um, actually as they, as they begin this process of articulating itself in relation to America, has been struggling to figure out who it is if it's not America. And the, the, the absence of a theological framework that feels sturdy enough to hold it um, is the result of that complete um, seamless um, co-constitution of the two realities. So were you raised to believe, Serene, were you raised to believe that America is a Christian country and should no, be a Christian yeah. country? No, I was raised to believe that, uh, that most Christians thought it was a Christian country and that it shouldn't be a Christian country and that Christianity, if it identified with the state, would lose its soul. So I was raised in this sort of progressive movement away from notions of America as Christian. Was Reinhold Niebuhr mm -hmm. already in your yeah. childhood? Yeah. There he was, yeah. yes. Uh -huh which is a long tradition of liberal Protestantism engaged in that kind of conversation. See, as I remember my upbringing in Philadelphia, which Sherman and I share, I was raised implicitly and then explicitly to believe that I fit in because Judaism was one of the religions in the Judeo-Christian tradition and because there were lots of ethnic neighborhoods in Philadelphia and I was in one of those ethnic neighborhoods. And then when my neighborhood became Vietnamese and Italian and black, okay. So this was, this was the mosaic, this was it. And we flew our, our little flags outside on all the American holidays and we belonged because we were Americans and our ethnicity and our religion made us Americans. And this was like basic to my parents' religion. This was not just a civic belief, this was a religious belief, I believe. Yeah, I mean, isn't it the, uh, yeah, I, I studied um, symbolic poverty and the, the you know, it's the wealthy people who can pretend to be mm -hmm. poor, exactly act to be right. poor, yet Absolutely. they still enjoy, there's no doubt that, th that they aren't. You know, it's, th it's the mm -hmm. poor who, who, can't, who just are, right? And, and um, there's a power in, in um, and privilege and sort of moral, um, uh, uh, you, you, you get a lot of, of points morally for giving up what you have, even though you've never really given it up. I mean, for, for a Christian to say, well, I'm not really with the, the, the majority, um, is, is, that, is that real? Um, and, and can minorities truly have, can, can minorities truly have that same choice? I mean, Sherman, you're arguing for, uh, for an authentic Muslim identity that is, um, that's choosing to, uh, you know, to define what it means to be an American, maybe in a little uh, different way. Mm -hmm. Is it realistic? Can, it, can that work? Well, when you say work, what do you mean? Uh, can you survive? <laughs> Will it be allowed? Will you be? Well, I, I think that, I think that uh, actually we have to, I think, Personally, we have to complicate our picture of America a little bit. Um, and I think that uh, I, I'd like to share the following with you as a way of complicating it. I remember uh, just after 9-11, um, there was a big, uh, Tavis Smiley sponsored a big State of Black America uh, conference. It was held in a church, a big church in Philadelphia. And to make a very long story short, at one point, Charles Ogletree, a uh, Harvard law professor, was moderating a session uh, posed the following question. He said, uh, what can we do uh, to make Muslims, this was just after 9-11, uh, what can we do to make Muslims feel more welcome, feel a more a part of the community? And before he could even get the question out fully, the Reverend Al Sharpton interrupted him and said, whoa, 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 wait a minute, hold on a second. He said, let's not get caught up in the mania of the dominant culture because there's not a person in this church who doesn't have a brother, a sister, an uncle, a 
cousin, a father, daughter, close family friend, someone who's intimately involved in their life, that's not already a Muslim. And so they already are a part of the community. And that fact cannot be, cannot be denied. So if you're talking about work, well, can it work in terms of finding community? It depends on the, of the level of community that, 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 that you're looking for. And I think that, that, that the notion of Jews or Muslims finding a space to be authentically Jew, Jewish or Muslim is always going to connote a minority status. And I don't think there's any way, I don't think there's any way around that. So yeah, I think it can work. Okay. So we have a few questions uh, from the audience. Where, where, what about the picture of whether it's a, um, uh, an Orthodox Jewish community or a, a Christian or a Muslim community that chooses, um, even geographically, to separate themselves? Where do they fit in to, to this picture? And is it a threat to the kind of, to the kind of, um, uh, a picture of, you know, being a, a Jew in America or being a Muslim in America that you are promoting or wishing for or hoping? Okay. I guess. Well, when I quoted Charles Lieben, I quoted him in affirmation. That is, I'm agreeing with him that Jews, in order to survive and thrive, are going to need to commit to a measure of distinctiveness greater than what most Jews seem willing to adhere to. So you've got to be different. And the difference has to be real. It's got to be things that people care about. But it would be inauthentic for us to create that difference at the expense of the American part of our identity. So as Sherman and, and Serena and I were saying, this calls for a redoing of both sides of the hyphen and not just one. And here I have to echo and, and affirm what Sherman said. You can't just tailor yourself to fit this other paradigm and let that paradigm stay in place without trying to change that paradigm. That's our job. That's our job. And America needs us to do that job. Mm -hmm. Because America provides a wonderful framework for us all to be um, here together and learn from each other, but America does not supply answers to the questions of ultimate meaning that all of us are asking. So America gives us the framework in which to seek that meaning and build that community, but America itself cannot provide that meaning and cannot provide that community. And so we have to help our, our people do that. But part of the challenge is, is that for many, America does provide that meaning. I I'm mean, not it, sure. It, Go ahead. I mean, I think that we do have a religion of America. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah so, absolutely. I mean, for, for many, it is their, uh, their source of ultimate meaning. So, you know, you have, you, you're, we're talking about constructing stories that are, and living in stories that are over and against that, when that itself is one of the players in many instances. This is probably a, a rather premature thought because I'm still thinking about it, but I'll share it anyway. We're on camera, aren't we? Yeah. Um, but but your, your comment just reminded me of this because sometimes I, I, I wonder whether, whether we are sort of, um, what we're seeing now out there uh, in society is, is something along the lines of a sort of uh, almost a Europeanization of America. And I don't mean racially, but I mean in the fact that America um, was always supposed to be negotiated identities. Um, not fixed identities, um, not, not like a French or, or a German or, you know, that, that are historically sort of uh, 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 almost fixed, as it were. Um, how do you become un-French if you're a French? Um, um, and, and so I, I think that um, perhaps more energy needs to be put in uh, reinvesting the process with this negotiating, this, this negotiating aspect uh, of who we are. That we go back to the point of actually arguing and, and, and talking about and negotiating who we are as opposed to capitulating to one particular group's definition of what it means to be American. So um, uh, this is a question here. It says it's for, for you, um, Sherman, um, but I think others can also chime in. The question is, um, Professor Jones says that sometimes she feels like Christians uh, in the media and through politics, um, uh, extremists have absconded with her religion. Um, 
Dr. Jackson, do you feel that way about the extremist Muslims who are so prominent in the current story of Islam in the world? How do you communicate to non-Muslims, to Americans, that this is not your religion? How, how do I, well, this is, a very, this is a very difficult question because the issue there is, is, is one uh, of credibility. And I think that one of the challenges that Muslims uh, uh, face in America right now, and it has a lot to do with the whole notion that Islam is this alien entity. I mean, it, it, doesn't have, it doesn't have credibility. I mean, Muslims can't even speak in such a way that they actually represent themselves. It's very difficult as a Muslim today to even open your mouth without just lapsing into apology. Um, because people don't expect you to simply say, well, what does your religion represent? They expect you to apologize about the Taliban and the you know, Al-Qaeda and all these kinds of things. I happen to live in Ann Arbor, Michigan. I don't live in Afghanistan, nor do I live in Pakistan. Uh, and yet, you know, for me to speak as a Muslim, I'm sort of expected, uh, well, to deal with all this first, and if there's any time left, then you can really tell me what you're about. Um, and, so, and so I want to be very clear here um, that there are very lamentable and condemnable actions that are carried out by Muslims in the world. There's no question about that, and nobody should be mealy-mouthed about it. Um, but, I, but I also think that um, someone was talking earlier in one of our earlier sessions that, that Islam has very much been mediatized. Uh, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about very quickly, if I could, Ingrid. Mm -hmm. yes, please. Um, I go back and forth uh, every year. I teach in a program in Cairo, Egypt. And for the last number of years, I've been doing a little bit of research. I've actually written one, one article on it. The guys who assassinated Anwar Sadat, m many of you are old enough to remember that, <laughs> I, I think. But, but you have to remember that, you know, you know, the Iranian Revolution happens in 1979. You know, Anwar Sadat's assassination is 1981. The Marine Barracks is 1982. This is the height, you know, of, 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 of quote unquote Islamic fundamentalism. All right? Now, the guys who assassinated Anwar al-Sadat, five of them were executed. The remainder were given long prison sentences. In prison, they began to study classical tradition, traditional Islam. And in 1997, they came out with a declaration. And by the way, this is the Gamaya Islamiyah, the largest of the Arab jihadi movements in the Arab world. They came out with a declaration in 1997 saying, we were wrong. We should not have assassinated Anwar al-Sadat. This was a sophomoric misunderstanding of our religion, and we were wrong. And they produced four books, which they all signed. To this day, they produced over 20 books. They even have a book in which they take Al-Qaeda to task. These are guys who did 25 years in Egyptian prisons who are still committed to the cause of Islam, but who simply say that violence that we were engaged in many years ago, it was wrong. And Osama bin Laden is doing the same thing now. It is wrong. They critique him. Now, has anyone ever heard of this in the West? This is what I, I, I'm saying. So yes, there, there are lamentable actions out there, but there are all kinds of other uh, activities that are, that are taking place. And, 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 and for the Gemaa Islamia to say this, in fact, they had sessions in which they were allowed by the Egyptian government to go around to various prisons and talk to other fundamentalists and, 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 and to dissuade them uh, from this old line of thinking. So I, I think that if we could open up the camera lens a bit wider uh, and, and catch some more of what is going on on the positive side, um, you know, we may be better served here in terms of our ability to imagine the possibilities because it's our inability to imagine the possibilities you know, that keeps us stuck uh, in, in these places where we are right now. There are a few questions about um, uh, about the neo-atheist movement, and um, uh, you know, perhaps uh, some of the um, 
the attempts to identify America as a Christian nation, the insistence that America is a Christian nation, could they be in response to that growing, growing atheism and growing secularism in American society? If that's the case, how, do, how do the, does the diversity of, of religions respond to that, or does that help? Does religious pluralism help? Um, can, it, can it be a response to, um, to the neo-atheist movement? Or does that have anything to do with how we begin to conceive uh, of ourselves and religion in America? I think it is in, it's in part a response to that, but the even larger response is this category of the unaffiliated mm -hmm. who are responding to that by simply walking out of the institution. And that's the single largest religious block in the country right now because they mm -hmm. consider themselves spiritual but not institutionally religious. And I think that's an even stronger statement about what what the reaction of, the, of this generation of people under 40 is to what they perceive to be the, um, the harms of this notion of a dominant culture institutionalized religion. There are, there are ample reasons for turning your back upon religion. There are horrible things done in God's name. Mm -hmm. Terrible things done in the name of religion. There are people who respond to the basic questions of human life, like why is there evil? Why is there injustice in the world? Why does this child die of cancer? They respond to these questions which oversimpli with oversimplifications that make one want to run the other way in horror. Mm. There are visions of God out there that I would like to run away from. So one understands this, but I think if you, if you get at the, the hunger that is underneath this, you see what all of us see as teachers. You see people, especially young people, who are desperate for meaning in their lives. They want to not waste their time on earth. They want to love and be loved. They want significance in their lives. And part of this drive to atheism is a rejection of hypocritical, oversimplistic, false notions of what religion is. I read Hitchens and Dawkins. I don't recognize this yeah, religion yeah. that they're caricaturing there. But if, if that was what religion was, I would also want nothing to do with it, right? Mm -hmm. So I want to be able to give people meaning and purpose and significance and love in their lives, and I'm convinced that it has to be done in communities. Mm -hmm. I'm convinced, and here I take my stand on this, I'm 58 years old, I'm too old for this stuff, I admit. Friend is not a verb, it's not. And you need communities that are face-to-face, -face, and then you get serious and you realize that one size does not fit all. So for us to provide people with this meaning and these communities, there are going to have to be serious differences among us. Right? We are not true to the variety of human beings if we try to cover up these differences or go lowest common denominator and run away from our differences because we're afraid of conflict. Unfortunately, we're human beings. So the lowest part of ourselves often wins out, right? And we cite the highest as an excuse to do the lowest, right? right? But we've got to have serious options for people, and I regard these religious traditions and communities as options that are there to answer this hunger for meaning and this deep desire for community, which is what we're all here to satisfy. The, the time is just, is just running. Um, uh, amazingly, we're, we're close to the end of our, our time for this conversation. Um, I'm going to ask one more question from the, those that have been sent up, and then uh, I'd like you to, if you would like to respond to it, it's fine. If not, then respond to um, uh, something that has, um, that's on your mind or that's been said by someone else on the mm -hmm. panel. And this is, um, uh, Sherman, you use this term indigenization of Islam. What is the role, or is there a role, for uh, our Jewish and Christian friends in, in that process? Uh, how, how, how do we, what's their relationship as we try to figure out what that means for us? Wow. <clears throat> well, let me, let, me, let me start off by um, Say, 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 saying the following, 
Um, I, I really do think that, that there are ways in which the whole enterprise of passing on my Islam to my children and hopefully to my grandchildren um, is very much enhanced and not threatened by the presence of Jews who are also trying to do the same thing. Uh, I think that oftentimes kids respond to what they see to be the, not only the, the irrelevance of, of Islam or Judaism in the space between the home and, and the mosque, uh, which I think we should talk a little more about, um, but, but, but to the irrelevance of, of, of religion uh, to that space. And I think that we really do have a crisis of relevance. And I think that for your kids to see my kids serious about Islam, uh, I think has a certain degree of inspirational power for them to see the, 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 the sort of the normalcy of being serious about, about Judaism. Um, the, the, the other thing is that I think right now Muslims in America are, are in a very, very difficult place. It's very difficult for Muslims simply, simply to talk. Um, and there are all kinds of uh, uh, reasons for that. Um, one of which we haven't talked about uh, uh, tonight is um, the race and the racialization of, of Islam as a community and what that does to marginalize their voices in terms of having the right to say anything about America without that being perceived as some kind of a threat. And here I think that um, the, 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 the Jewish community um, could be a very important ally in terms of simply, not simply, allowing or, or, or allowing for a space within which Muslims can, can speak by recognizing that the same voices that seek to shut Muslims down would also do the same to the Jewish or other communities um, at a certain point. Um, and, and that's where I think that, that this business has to get really very serious because um, nothing short of our, our, our future really uh, is, is at stake as Jews and Muslims in America. Right. Serene, would you like to say anything about, about this? Um, one of the dimensions of, um, oh, there's so much to say. What, one of the different, one of the dimensions of um, the difference that you're describing is that um, not only does it allow us as human beings to be different from one another, but I think it's also true that in another's difference you often find yourself, that you get um, a clearer sense of, of who you are. So it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a way of thinking about a mutual enhancement that happens in the context of differentiation. Um, um, uh, I think he might even be here, Paul Knitter, um, teaches at Union, wrote a book called Without the Buddha, I Couldn't Be a Christian. Mm -hmm. And describing how he's a Christian, but it was in Buddhism that he actually found something that had been lost to his own understanding of the self. Um, and that's, what, that's where this whole process of imagination and practice gets fascinating mm -hmm. and energizing and revitalizing of our community. Yeah. Arnie, you're our host and I'd like to give you uh, maybe the last observation on, on uh, this or some of the things we've been talking about. Um, what's, what's, your, what's your role as a, as a Jewish leader in uh, you know, our community? The Muslim community is, is uh, not in very good shape right now in many ways. And uh, for us to um, articulate an authentic identity sounds to many people like um, we don't want to be American. Um, what, what, can, what can you say to, to help us, uh, help us along, other than what you've done, putting together this whole thing? Well, Ingrid has given me, I think knowingly, the opportunity for a kind of a commercial. <laughs> so we'll, we'll end with a word from our sponsor. <laughs> We're sitting in an institution, the Jewish Theological Seminary of America, 
which was founded and then refounded in, in 1902 because a group of civic leaders in New York realized that we needed to have a new kind of Judaism for America and to train a new kind of rabbi for that Judaism. And so this place was dedicated from the beginning to the notion that Judaism had to be retained, to coin a word, it had to be conserved, <coughs> hence conservative Judaism, but it could not be conserved in any of its previous forms because none of them were gonna work here and America demanded something new and gave an opportunity for something new which would benefit not just America but Judaism. Mm -hmm. And that's a claim. That's a kind of a faith. And you can't prove it or disprove it scientifically, you can only prove it by making it so. I um, brought along a little quotation from Abraham Joshua Heschel which I can use as my last text. The modern Jew is but an experiment. And who can be sure that the experiment will succeed? I could say the same thing about the modern Christian. I could say the same thing about the modern Muslim. America is the place where we can test the proposition that that can succeed. And part of making it succeed is the kind of trust you build up by talking with people who have fundamental differences from you so you can discover what your commonalities are and you can talk about what your differences are. Mm -hmm. And this is new in the history of religion. It's part of what makes for a modern Jew, I would venture to say a modern Christian, a modern Muslim. And so I want to thank you all for helping us use this institution, use this building for the purpose for which it was intended. I, I have five very brief announcements. Um, <laughs> let me just say the obvious, which is uh, we have all had the extraordinary pleasure of witnessing tonight what I think we could fairly call the start of a beautiful friendship. Um, I want to thank the audience very much for your participation and your interest. Um, this event could not have taken place without the singular struggle of two people who really worked incredibly hard to put it together. One is Jessica Margolin, and the other is Tom Kajdan. Tom, raise your hand. I'm delighted to say that we're also partnering with the New York Public Library. Um, the New York Public Library 42nd Street branch has an ongoing exhibit, it just opened last week, on the three faiths, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, and it is gorgeous. Number four is to once again call your attention to the website, www.jtsa.edu. And finally, once again, please join me in giving thanks to four of America's premier theologians and religious leaders. <laughs>